So what songs do you listen to when you get in your car or you go to the gym or you get home on a Friday evening and you're just looking to sit back and chill out? What songs fill you with a sense of ease and lightness, joy and gratitude? Here's the lyrics to the chorus of the song we're going to hear together in just a bit. And before we look at that, I, I realized uh, this song may not be the most well-known song. It's a song called Home by Justin Furstenfeld. It may not have topped the charts. Uh, don't worry, we're going to have plenty of those songs in this series throughout the summer. But I have to be honest with y'all, this song has become, as of late, a favorite in the Canada household. It has accompanied many family dance parties in the kitchen. And the chorus reads like this. Like dancing in the kitchen in the pale moonlight. Only care in the world is that our kids are all right. Daddy loves mama and mama loves him. Tomorrow we get to do it over again. So smile at me, baby. Take my breath away. With the good Lord willing, I'll be happy to say that daddy loves mama and mama loves him. Tomorrow we get to do it over again. Now when that song comes on, it just kind of does something to me. Because that's what music does, right? Music does something to you. Now, but before we get there, I want to share with you a story briefly, a story about a prophet named Elijah. And Elijah's story can be found in the book, the Old Testament book of First Kings, which comes right before the book of Second Kings. All right, some of y'all are with me this morning. This is good. Now, here's the thing about Elijah. His name means in Hebrew, Yahweh is God. Now keep in mind, Yahweh is another name for God. In, in fact, in the Old Testament, you'll see uh, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, and it'll usually be in a smaller font. That's Yahweh, Lord, Yahweh. Now if your name essentially means God is God, when it comes to the biblical text, your story is headed places. You're going somewhere. Now here's the thing you need to know about Elijah. Up until this point, he has been smooth sailing, cruising. He has been uh, confronting the kings and the powers of the day. He's been doing miracles. He has been raising people out from their uh, graves, from the dead. He has been even calling down lightning from the heavens. I mean, everything is going his way. He is on top of things. He's on his game. Until we get to 1 Kings chapter 19. And things are turning south for Elijah. He's had a rough ride. He is now suicidal. He's hungry and angry and exhausted. He's disillusioned. He spends the night in a cave because he's paranoid that people are after him. And so what happens is God comes to Elijah and says, Here, Elijah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out onto the mountain and stand in the presence of of Yahweh because Yahweh is about to pass by and you don't want to miss it. So we pick up in verse 11. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now this story is funny, isn't it? In fact, if we're not laughing, we have missed the point of this story. I mean, check it out. This is how the story goes. Elijah's having a rough ride. He's now suicidal. Everything's turned south on him. And God comes to him and says, I want you to go out to the mountain. Yahweh's going to pass you by. Be, be ready for it. Yahweh wasn't in the wind. But Yahweh wasn't in the earthquake. But Yahweh wasn't in the fire. Then came a gentle whisper. In the Hebrew, it translates as a small, a, a thin blowing sound. Can you imagine it? And Elijah, 
he covers his face, his face with his cloak because he knows the stories that have come before him and people who've seen God face to face. And he's standing out and he's probably got his arms open wide because he's sure this is the big moment. He's going to receive his word of direction. He's going to get his guidance. He's going to get shown his path. And he's going to receive that sur- sure and certain word. And he stands there like this. And what does the voice say to him? Elijah, what are you doing here? Come on, man. God, you told me to be here. Have you forgotten about this conversation? Maybe you're the delusional one. You told me to be here. You said Yahweh was going to pass by. See, Elijah was looking for the neon sign, the big thing, the thunder, for it to be written in the sky. Just someone tell me what to do here. And instead, it comes as a gentle whisper. And the whisper is a question. Classic Jewish subversive writing at its finest Go on to the mountain to have this divine experience, and the divine experience is of the divine saying to you, what are you doing here? You know why this story is so good? Because it's just so dang true, isn't it? How many times have you and I looked for the neon sign, the thunder, the big thing. Someone just tell me what to do here. Here I am, just give me the answers, tell me what to do. And instead, it's found in the stillness, the quiet, the whisper, the thin blowing sound. But that's always the temptation, isn't it? When you're at a crossroads in your life, or you're going through some sort of transition or all of a sudden things start to get hard. God, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Man, I have to be honest with y'all. Sometimes when it comes to this God stuff, I want to get lazy, especially when things get hard. God, just tell me what to do. Just tell me the rules and I'll follow them. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And I imagine in those moments every time God responds with something like this. Oh, you think that's who I am? You think I'm just up there somewhere controlling everything? Like you're some kind of puppet and I hold the strings. And, and, and I've got your life all planned out for you. And if you just obey enough, if you just follow the rules enough, then I will come along and give you the right answers. Come on, Ryan, you really think I'm that boring? Ryan, do you really think I'm that much of a control freak? That much of an egomaniac? Come on. And by the way, this is why religious fundamentalism is so compelling for so many people. Because in a world filled with uncertainties, for a God who can step down and just remove all of life's complexities and give us all the right answers as long as we obey enough and follow the rules enough, Man, that God's kind of compelling on some days, isn't it? I mean, if I'm honest, there's some days I crave that God. And, and when religious leaders, when they fill up auditoriums and they're busy telling people exactly how it is, and all you've got to do is do A, B, and C, and then God is going to act in your favor, maybe even line your pockets just a bit. Man, some days I want that God if I'm honest. But see, the problem with that system is, it always reduces God to a transaction rather than a relationship. And the transactional God says, you do something for me, and then I'll do something for you. You do this, then I'll do that. And the relational God says, screw that. We are in it together. We fall together, and we rise together. Oh, you think thought you could just come to some mountain and I would give you all the answers as if that's even possible. Oh, you thought you could just come to the mountain and I would reveal to you some sort of path that I created for you. Oh, I get it. You thought my love for you was conditional. 
You thought it depended upon something you could do. You thought you could earn it. My brothers and sisters, the best and deepest kinds of relationships don't function that way. They are filled with unconditional love and grace. And the best and deepest relationships have the ability and the power and the right to ask us some of the hardest questions. Like, what are you doing here? Seriously, what, what are you doing with your life? So my friends, have you been so busy looking for the big thing that you are actually missing everything that God is doing all around you? Are you missing the gentle whisper? Because the summer months are here. It means it's a good time to slow down, to pause. Are you taking time to listen to your life? Are you taking time to listen to the the built-in intuition, the divine wisdom that resides in all of us? Are you taking time to listen to what the mystics called the true self or the authentic self? Are you taking time to listen to the small, still voice, the gentle whisper, the thin, blowing sound? And by the way, if this were easy, we wouldn't be talking about it, would we? But see, what I know is when I live in communion with the relational God, when I'm taking time to listen to my life, I I start seeing God in all the ordinary stuff, all the small stuff. And, and, And when I do this, when I live in this way, I'm better equipped to say no to that culture of anxiety, that culture that tells me to just keep doing more so I can be more because your worth obviously is found in your productivity. And so you're always hustling for your worth. See, I can better say no to that culture. I mean, this is why this story is so good, because it's just so dang true, isn't it? I mean, how many times, how many of us have gone through some sort of storm in life, and in the midst of the storm, we stand out there like, God, come on, where are you at, man? Here I am, Lord, where are you at? But Yahweh wasn't in the wind and Yahweh wasn't in the earthquake and Yahweh wasn't in the fire and is it true that it was only after the storm that you heard the gentle whisper You know, Tammy, my wife, and I, we were in um, Houston, Texas last weekend. And see, when we checked into our hotel in Houston, Texas, the nice lady at the front desk, she gave us two free drink coupons for the bar and restaurant downstairs. And and see, the bar and restaurant, it was outside in Houston, Texas. You all know what that means? 95 degrees and about 4,000% humidity. Oh, it was perfect. And so that evening, instead of walking to some other restaurant, we decided to eat in that restaurant, that bar. And so we go downstairs, and we're sitting outside, and, and as we sat down, I remembered I had these two free drink coupons in my pocket. And so I asked Tammy, I said, what do you want? She says, I'll do a glass of red wine. So I walk up to the bar, which was just a few few feet away, and I I said to the bartender, I'll use this one for uh, red wine, and he pours that and brings it back, and then he says, well, what do you want? And it was like that moment I hadn't thought about it and too many options, and so I got all nervous and stumbled over my words, and what I really wanted was just the coffee. But the problem was we were outside in Houston, Texas. Coffee wasn't going to cut it, so I thought, you know what, I'll just get a Coke. Nah, I can't do a Coke. Those are only for special occasions. They're loaded with sugar. I'll save that for a special occasion. So I said the only thing that came to my mind, the only thing that I could blurt out was a Shirley Temple. (laughs) Now, do you all know what a Shirley Temple is? Yeah, my daughter loves Shirley Temples, don't you, Selah? 
a Shirley Temple. I can't have a Coke because it's loaded with sugar. So I tell you what, just take a glass, pour soda in it, and then take grenadine, which is just a sugary syrup, and pour some of that in it, and top it off with a cherry, then we'll call it good. And the bartender just looks at me like, who is this tattooed fella ordered a Shirley Temple? And so he makes the Shirley Temple. I grab the Shirley Temple and the glass of red wine, and I walk back to the table, and I set this one in front of Tammy and this one in front of me, and no lie, she looks at me. She says, did you seriously order a Shirley Temple? I said, honey, it's a long story. Don't worry about it. Just enjoy your wine. But see what that did for us is we started having this conversation about um, some of the chaos I brought into the marriage before I got sober, when I was drinking. And... Uh, we started talking about how bars were bad scenes for Ryan because they turned into being a place all about Ryan and it just became a place about more and more and more and, and she asked me this really great question that I hadn't reflected upon before. She said, when was the moment that it changed for you where you could like actually sit with me at dinner and I could be having a glass of wine and the bar is just a few feet away and you're like a normal human being? You're not like filled with anxiety and obsessed with what's happening across the room. And that's a good question. And, and what I can tell you is um, I don't recall any big moment. There was no riding in the sky. There was no lightning and thunder. There was no like God saying this is how it is. But see what I can tell you is over time what happened was I found the power in dealing with my past rather than running from it. Over time, I found the power in getting honest with people, especially other guys, and letting them know what was in here, not trying to keep it all in. Over time, I found the power of making right some of my wrongs and going to people I'd hurt and making things right. I encountered a God who was filled with this kind of unconditional love and grace, the kind I could have never imagined. And see, what happened was, over time, I started to get comfortable living in my own skin. And I wasn't so scared of all the hard stuff anymore. And, and over time, I actually started to like the person that God created. I know, it's a novel idea, right, that you would like the person God created, you would like yourself. And see, over time, what happened was, I could actually be better at listening to that still small voice, the gentle whisper after the storm, the, the thin blowing sound. And see, when I do that, I've experienced it over and over 100% of the time. When I live that way, it creates these moments in which God and goodness and gratitude are found in the most ordinary stuff, the small stuff, because you know the small stuff is really the big stuff, right? And see, every single time, it creates those moments, if I let it, it creates those moments where I say, man, I get to do this. Man, I get to do this. I get to participate in this life. I get to wake up in the morning. I get to participate in the most ordinary stuff in life. And then tomorrow, I get to do it all over again. And Lord willing, the next day, I get to do it all over again. And again, and again, and again. And what happens is the most unremarkable days become the most remarkable. Because it's like dancing in the kitchen in the pale moonlight. Only care in the world is that our kids are all right. Daddy loves mama, and mama loves him. Tomorrow we get to do it over again. So smile at me, baby. Take my breath away. With the good Lord willing, I'll be happy to say that daddy loves mama, and mama loves him. Tomorrow we get to do it over again. 